Hello, I'm Dr. Manuel G. Saldivar. I'm a cognitive psychologist and a university faculty member. This video is one in a series associated with a textbook by Jeffrey Levy entitled Psychology, the Science of Human Potential. This is a free open source textbook that's available for anyone to use. A link to this textbook can be found below this video in the description box. The purpose of this video is not to cover every single point in the textbook. Rather, it's meant to give students an overview of the contents and the big ideas, the main themes of every particular chapter. So let's get started. In prior chapters of the Levy textbook, we've discussed how humans have evolved to behave in certain ways in response to stimuli from the world around us. The last chapter, chapter 3 of the Levy textbook, talked about how external stimuli are sensed by our various sensory systems, including our eyes, ears, skin, and other sense organs. That was the concept of sensation. And then our brain puts together all this information from our eyes, ears, nose, etc. in a process called perception. And that's how we really are able to start to develop an understanding of what's happening in the world around us. In this chapter, chapter 4 of the Levy text, we're going to discuss internal stimuli. Stuff that affects our behavior that we aren't necessarily aware is happening and often can't be observed by other people around us, but nonetheless does have a significant effect on our emotional state and on, even on our motivations to do or not do certain things. Emotions might seem relatively easy to understand. Um, something scary happens and you get frightened. Something good happens and you become happy. But really, human emotion is much more complex than that. Scientists haven't really agreed on one universal explanation for how human emotions work on a basic level. But there are three competing theories that have been put forward by psychologists over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. These three theories are discussed in more detail in, in again, chapter 4 of the Levy textbook. And um, all of them are still being debated, but they, taken together, these three theories kind of stake out the ground of where are we or, or what is kind of the, the spectrum or the continuum of opinions about this debate over how human emotion works. The first of these three theories of emotion was put forward by James and Lang. So, <laughs> not surprisingly, it's called the James-Lang theory. And they argue that we will perceive some kind of stimulus in the world around us. Uh, for example, we are walking uh, through the forest and all of a sudden a bear comes out from behind a tree. They argue that evolution has built into us certain physiological responses to stuff that happens to us. Like in this example, a frightening thing. Okay, we're walking on the forest and a bear suddenly jumps out. Uh, from behind a tree, um, they would argue that after that stimulus is perceived, that then we go through a process of physiological arousal. Arousal in psychological terms just means um, a state uh, that is more excited, more active uh, than the baseline of just being at rest. So James and Lang, uh, we have a stimulus, we have uh, some event that happens that causes physiological arousal. And then because, for example, if we uh, encounter a bear, our, our fight or flight impulses, which are discussed in the textbook, may kick in. So our body is going to dump adrenaline into our circulatory system. And the fact that this adrenaline dump is happening, that can create an emotional response that we then subsequently will label as fear or or being frightened. A slightly different view comes from Cannon and Bard, and they put forward their theory, so of course it's called the Cannon-Bard theory. The Cannon-Bard theory, in contrast, of course has the same starting point. There's some stimulus that we perceive in the world around us, but they argue that instead of going through this sequence of uh, that 
James and Lang saw as key, which is a stimulus, then a physiological response, and then an emotional response. They see the emotional response and the physiological arousal state as happening at the same time. Uh, and they explain this because they argue that, and in fact there is some evidence for this, that there are different parts of our body, different organ systems involved in the physiological arousal. That's mostly uh, a result of the endocrine system, of the our system of glands in the body. And the emotional response, of course, is centered in our brains. The final theory of emotion that has gained traction in recent years, and I would argue is probably as close to state-of-the-art as we have now, is put forward by Schachter and Singer. And they add an extra step that the other theories didn't really include. So the Schachter-Singer take on how emotion works is, again, starting with a stimulus. We perceive something happening in the world around us. Let's go back to our example, the bear. We're walking down the... Um, walking through a forest, and we see a bear come out from behind a tree. That's the stimulus. Now, if we're walking in a forest, and we're just out on a hike, uh, you know, enjoying the day, uh, it's likely that upon seeing a bear, we'll recognize that we potentially are in danger. That causes this step of physiological arousal. But Skakter and Singer would argue there's also a step that comes before the emotional response of being afraid, being feeling fear. And that's the cognitive appraisal stage. And what that means is that, and again, it's happening very quickly in our minds, but there is a step, they would argue, where you have a process where you're thinking through, you may not be conscious of it, you may not mean to do it, but it happens because it's been wired into your brain by evolution, where you appraise or, or try and understand the situation to help you determine what is the best emotional response. A good, uh, maybe parallel to this in terms of the cognitive appraisal is that there is uh, a nurture aspect here, uh, an aspect in terms of our experience, uh, how we think of the world around us. I personally am, am just a humble psychology professor. Uh, if I am walking down the hallway and I see a tiger come around the corner, I'm probably going to appraise that as a very dangerous situation. Why is there a tiger walking around in the corridor? Um, it could hurt me. If I was a tiger uh, keeper at a zoo and I had experience in training and taking care of tigers, uh, tigers, I may walk around a corner, see a tiger, and certainly acknowledge that there is some danger. Maybe not take things for granted that oh, I'm I'm perfectly safe, but I may be more calm or or have a different perspective uh, on how to deal with this tiger if I've had training and experience than if I was just some random guy walking around and I saw a tiger. Again, the point here is this cognitive appraisal step that Skakter and Singer include in their theory is something that was sort of a new development, a new piece to this debate about um, about theories of human emotion. And again, it, it goes to, or it kind of is feeding into this idea that we do go through a process where the context, the situation, the particular circumstances actually have an influence on our emotional response. It's not just about the stimulus and the physiological reaction. One of the reasons... For this debate, one of the reasons why psychologists are spending a lot of time thinking about this issue of exactly what is the nature of emotion is because we have a lot of evidence now uh, from recent decades that um, motivation, which is related to this idea of cognitive appraisal, this idea of having a context or situation to help us make sense of stuff happening around us, motivation has a much bigger influence on our emotional state than was thought of previously. That's why these changes. That's why there have been uh, these different changes to theories of emotion. Why they've grown and, and developed over time. In psychological terms, motivation is when someone engages in a sustained action to address a specific condition. So, if your condition is I'm hungry, then you might want to achieve a specific objective. I want to make a sandwich because I'm hungry. Motivation is what makes us get up off the couch and make a sandwich because we're responding to this condition or the situation of being hungry. Often stimuli that drive motivation, such as hunger, are not visible to others. And so that makes it challenging for psychologists to understand the cause and effect of what motivates human beings because oftentimes we can only measure that motivation, measure that stuff that's causing people to do things in an indirect way. We can't observe it or measure it directly as easily as we can measure 
um, someone's weight or someone's height. However, there are broad patterns of behavior and motivation being an aspect of behavior that have been identified by psychologists. These behaviors and motivations tend to be nearly universal among humans because genetically, if you are a human being, if you're a member of this uh, human species, by definition, you're going to have a lot of genetic similarities to other humans, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be a member of the same species. So by identifying stuff that all humans tend to do, tend to react and behave in the same way, then that gives us some idea that this is something that's rooted in uh, our heredity, in the genetic component, i.e., given a certain set of circumstances, situation, uh, stimuli, humans will tend to react in certain ways, depending on, on the particular situation or context. The textbook by Levy goes into much more detail, but uses the two examples of the sexual response cycle and phases of sleep. So these, again, are meant to be examples of behaviors, sexual behavior, sleep behavior, that uh, what that looks like, how those processes play out in the real world, tend to look very, very similar across humans because we are humans. In other words, if you are a human being, you um, will almost certainly tend to follow a certain pattern in terms of sexual response. If you are a human being, you'll tend to follow a certain pattern in terms of uh, your sleep cycle because you are human. The big takeaway from this chapter is that the why of our actions, which is uh, for our purposes going to be synonymous with our motivations, the why of our actions, our motivations, are the result between a very complex interaction between stuff in the world around us, stuff that we're perceiving, and our own thinking, our own cognitive assessment of that stuff. Again, to repeat my old example, most of us would be would feel terror if we walked to a room and there was a tiger there, because we know tigers are dangerous. But if we were an experienced zookeeper, and you walked to a room and there was a tiger there, you're probably going to have a different experience. Not because the tiger has changed, not because the tiger is magically less dangerous or whatever, but if you're familiar with working with tigers because you're a zookeeper, you're probably going to have a different state of mind about that situation than a civilian, so to speak, who doesn't know anything about tigers and walks to a room and oh, there's a tiger sitting there. The emotion of fear that a civilian might have uh, on meeting a tiger is based on an environmental factor. The tiger's in the room with us. There's a tiger here. But our knowledge and experience are cognitive or thinking-related factors. If we were a zookeeper versus just an ordinary person, it would lead us to interpret that situation about being in a room with a tiger in a very different way. Same situation, but different emotional outcomes. Again, this is why coming up with a theory that explains emotions in a universal way can be very challenging because it's so complex. Similarly, motivations can differ among human beings, even uh, or especially if, if situation is similar. For example, imagine two students who both receive a C on a test in school. A student who loves to learn, a student who likes the subject, um, who is really uh, eager to learn more stuff, they may get that C grade, and they see it as a challenge. I didn't do very well. Obviously, I got to see in this test, but let me work harder. Let me study more. Let me try study uh, using different techniques, and the next time I'll do better. So this one student might get a C on a test and still maintain a positive outlook, and, and they're focused on thinking about how can I do better next time. In contrast, another student who maybe has a history of struggling in school, isn't that engaged with school, uh, should I be in college, why am I in college in the first place, they might get a C, and it can be a very challenging, difficult situation. They might focus on negatives. They might focus on, oh, I studied for however many hours, but I still got a C. I should give up. I'm a terrible student. I'll never make it through college. Neither one of these students um, having a positive or negative outlook is necessarily right or wrong. It's an issue of what their motivations are. If you uh, look at, at college, let's say, as something, uh, a challenge, a problem to be solved, uh, a challenge to be overcome, something where it's okay to make mistakes and, and you can do better next time, you may respond to uh, a, a not-so-great grade, like a C on a test, in a different way from a student who has been struggling in school, who maybe doesn't know why they're in college or feels confused about 
uh, you know, what, are, what, what is the benefit to me of being in college? Again, the same situation, but different motivations may exist about what to do next. That concludes today's video. I hope you've found this overview helpful for your own studies. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this video useful. It really helps my YouTube channel grow. Good luck with your continuing studies of psychology as well as with the rest of your college career. Take care.